Get right back. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the primary reason I'm holding this microphone is for the people who are streaming. So you may think this is a small room and we don't need this, but that's why. Uh, Welcome to the center of the universe. Has, is this your first time here or have people been here before? Yeah. Well, double welcome then. Uh, I'm Ben, I'm the chair of the Friends of the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory. We are the organization that organizes the star parties. We work here, we are leased these buildings by the National Research Council, but otherwise we are supported by memberships, donations, gift shop sales, and so on and so forth. Um, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the territory of the Sanchothan speaking peoples of the Coast Salish. Um, and we even occasionally talk to them and we're trying to get pull them into redesigning the center at some point in the future to include their culture who um, they believe that this is, that they call this place Wetixus and they uh, believe that uh, it was stolen from them. And um, we have some feathers to unruffle. Um, this evening, I am happy to introduce someone I've known for quite a long time, Mr. Dr. Stephen Gwynn. Stephen is a data specialist at the Canadian Astronomy Data Center, which is in that building down the hill that you passed. Um, the CADC has been up for, I forget exactly how long, mid-80s, right? Mm -hmm. And it was originally one of the first only places in the world that stored data from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and Stephen did his PhD at the University of Victoria. He took over my desk. <laughs> <laughs> working on Hubble Space Tele Telescope uh, data. He then got a job in France, um, in Marseille, and finally came back here to work on, uh, to work with the, Can with, with the CADC. Stephen is really used to giving extremely exciting technical talks to very clever astronomers. So he's going to do his best to, um, to, to talk, talk, uh, talk intelligently to you without talking down. Um, there is one other thing Stephen is famous for. He was the one who created maps for the New Horizons spacecraft that went to Pluto. So that's the kind of work he does and we are <coughs> delighted to have him here. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Ben. I should say that what I'm actually used to is giving talks about data and the actual science I leave mostly to other people. So I'm, some of the science parts of this talk are actually going to be a bit weak because uh, I'm a little bit fluffy on them myself. I'm actually more interested in the hardware and the data management side of, side of things. So first question is, who here has heard of the Hubble Space Telescope? Everybody. Who here has heard of James Webb Space Telescope? Who here, without looking at the screen, has heard of the Euclid Space Telescope? Way less people. <laughs> and uh, So I'm going to fix that tonight <laughs> and, and talk to you about the Euclid Space Telescope. Um, so first thing, I start off with a picture of breakfast from last Saturday morning. Um, so there's the cinnamon buns, there's the coffee, there's my cell phone, which is uh, streaming to the, um, to the television, which is showing the end. There's my daughter's knees, uh, uh, and we're watching uh, the Euclid, the launch of Euclid that happened last Saturday at 11.12 Eastern Time, so 8.12 breakfast time here in Victoria uh, from Cape Canaveral. Um, it was a successful launch. It was a boring launch, and that's great. I like boring launches. This is what an exciting launch looks like. <laughs> you don't want an exciting launch, and so this launch went Absolutely perfectly. So Euclid launched successfully from Cape Canaveral and is now on its one month mission out to uh, spot uh, uh, beyond the Earth 
uh, away from the sun, a uh, place called L2, which is the same place as James Webb has gone. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the spacecraft for a bit. So uh, it, it's a, a telescope tube. You know, so light comes in here, goes down here to a big primary mirror, and then it was reflected out to a mirror that you can't, well, it's behind this thing here, and then back into where all, all this instrumentation is back at the back of the telescope. And then if we go over to this picture, um, so that's sort of the, the business end and then sort of the, uh, the, the sort of the science end. And this side here is a giant solar panel and a uh, uh, communications antenna. And this always faces towards the sun. So it gets power, and this always faces towards the Earth so that we can get the data back, which is um, key. So, um, yeah. So the next slide it shows Euclid with a person in front of it, which sort of gives a sense of scale. And so it's large-ish, but if you kind of look at this person, this person's actually uh, not working for you, so he's just wearing... Uh, the, the the clean lab coat, clean suit, because this is in the clear room just before launch. He's just kind of going there. Yep, looks like a telescope to me, but <laughs> he's not actually doing anything useful. He's just appreciating its majesty. Uh, but on the other hand, if you see the the, the, the uh, this sort of gives you a sense of scale. So this guy is stands like that. And that's how big the telescope is. So it's not a huge, giant thing. Uh, it's actually a relatively modest, modest affair. So this is uh, gives you um, shows the James Webb and the Hubble Space Telescope that everybody's heard of, and then the Euclid one before. So Hubble is you know uh, two two point one meters, so that's bigger than a person, but not by much. James Webb is way bigger than a person, and then Euclid is a much smaller little thing over here. So it's a much less collecting area. Um, but what where Euclid shines compared to those other two telescopes is the size of the camera. So this shows you the Hubble Space Telescope's one of its biggest cameras is that little square there. And then James Webb's biggest telescope is this, and that's actually smaller than that because it's two there's a gap in between. There's two small cameras side by each. And then this is Euclid's main camera. Okay, so it's vastly larger. So it takes up uh, 0.7 by 0.7 of a degree. So that's sort of, well, it's not a huge patch in the sky at once, but it's vastly larger than those other two uh, uh, telescopes. And so this uh, picture shows the actual camera itself. Um, and you can see it's actually not one camera, it's 36 4K by 4K, 4,000 by 4,000 pixel cameras all in the same thing. And you can see it all looks blue. And the reason it looks blue is because uh, the cameras absorb like 98% of all the red light that, or green light that falls on it. They're extremely sensitive in, in that part of the thing. So all the light that falls on those things gets absorbed. Whereas the blue light just bounces off and then you can see it. So that's why that camera looks blue. The camera physically itself is sort of about, <laughs> I have to hold my camera and gesticulate, the same, hold my microphone and gesticulate at the same time, sort of physically about this big, uh, sort of about a foot across. So the reason it has a big camera is it's going to make a map of uh, most of the, a third of the sky. So this the outline in blue here shows the outline of the survey area that Euclid's going to survey. So if you were to make a map of everything that James, uh, sorry, Hubble Space Telescope has taken a picture of in the last 33 years, which is actually the last, when I first met Ben, uh, was basically at Hubble's launch in 1990, uh, it would be these tiny little dots that you couldn't even really see. Whereas Euclid's going to make pictures of not all the sky, just a third of it, but still a substantial fraction of it are all going to have pictures that are taken. Um, the reason for the strange pattern is it's actually only interested in kind of the boring parts of the sky. It's trying to do a sort of uniform survey of all the distant galaxies, and it doesn't want anything in the foreground. So it's avoiding this, which is the Milky Way galaxy, the galactic plane. And then this other part that's evaded, it's avoiding, the, it's harder to see, is actually the ecliptic. So that's where the... Um, uh, all the stars, sorry, all the planets are, and all the asteroids are all on that plane. And what is, what's also there is this stuff called the uh, zodiacal dust, which uh, raises the background. So it was looking for the darkest parts of the sky. Uh, 
And then, so that's the main survey area, and then you can see these little bits in blue, sorry, what do I say, little bits in yellow are parts where it's staring more deeply into the sky, We're coming back uh, year after year to sort of do the calibrations, check that everything's still working the same way, and also to provide uh, sort of deeper images. Okay, so now an extremely brief history of the universe in one slide. <laughs> this, this diagram is, starts here with the Big Bang. And then over here is us with sort of normal, you know, the universe as we see it now. And then in between we have uh, sort of, the, we have to start with the Big Bang. There's this rapid expansion part that's called inflation. And then you end up with an area, where there's sort of a color map. That color map, if it was to do it properly, would actually be just completely all the same color. It's just been really, really enhanced. What happens is the universe was actually very, very, very uniform at that point. So the most dense part of the universe was only one part in a thousand, sorry, 10,000 more dense than the least dense part. It was very, very smooth. Whereas you can tell now, that's definitely not the case. Uh, there's, there's people and things, and then there's air and there's space, and everything's sort of all clumped together. And then this sort of shows the evolution of how things went from almost completely smooth uh, and then became more and more clumped together to form the galaxies, the stars, and us. And the Euclid's mission is to study how that evolution happened. So there's this part which you can't quite see with Euclid, and then there's this part here. And then it's actually, you're looking at the dark matter, which is most of the universe is actually made out of dark matter, not regular matter, the stuff that we can see and touch. Uh, when I say dark matter, we don't quite know what it is. We have a very good idea of what it isn't. Uh, and it's not something that's, when I say dark, it's not dark like it's really, really black. It's black like, it's, it's dark like you can't see it. It doesn't interact with light at all. Uh, back when I was a graduate student in the 90s, there was various theories that it might be sort of something that was really, really dark, like black holes or stars that hadn't turned on yet or dust. And that one by one, all those theories kind of got ruled out. And so we're now we're stuck with something that is something weird <laughs> or something we don't know about exactly. Uh, and then that's what sort of Euclid's trying to do. So I'm gonna show a bunch of slides here that are sort of uh, the evolution of the dark matter and uh, the regular matter. Uh, so what happens is there's so much dark matter, it actually drives the collapse of stuff into, uh, into galaxies, into, into the, the structure of the universe is driven by the dark matter. You start off with this almost completely uniform thing, and then it's sort of one part's ever so slightly over dense, and that part has more gravity, and that pulls more stuff into it, and then uh, you keep on doing that over a few thousands and millions and then billions of years, and you, the, the dense parts get denser, and the uh, less dense parts get less dense. So I'm just going to walk through that. And then, so that, that's what's shown in, in black and gray and whatnot is the dark matter. And then the yellow stuff is sort of the real stuff. Sorry, not the real stuff. The stuff we can see. <laughs> the real stuff. The stuff that matters to us because we're made out of it. The right stuff. It, uh, the bright stuff. Uh, and so you can sort of see this is sort of not all the same area. It's actually a slice of accumulation uh, and things get steadily is more and more clumpy. The, 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 the dark matter is more concentrated and there's more of these voids where there's nothing um, as, as time goes on to what it looks more or less like today where there's, it's quite uh, uh, nowhere, nowhere near uniform. It's very, very um, clumped together. So that's a science that uh, I'm not super good at, but uh, how do we do that? And the answer is you can't see the dark matter itself, but it, it bends space. And so it's sort of like, this is a, uh, you know, one of those old windows where you have kind of uh, a wibbly glass and it bends the, the, you can't see the window itself, but you can see the, how it's distorting the stuff that's behind the window. And so it's the same with uh, uh, dark matter with the gravity, um, uh, it's so strong that it actually bends. This is sort of an extreme example. This is James Webb data because we don't have any Euclid data yet, where you can see that these, all these arcs, all these are background galaxies that have, uh, that have bent, uh, been bent by the dark matter around this large galaxy in the middle. Now, why 
are we talking about this here in Canada? Because this is a European Space Agency thing. And the answer is this. This is how Euclid sees the universe in black and white. And what we need is color information because uh, the colors tell you how far away things are. So otherwise you just have a 2D picture of the universe, but you need color information to tell. You can tell that even just looking at this picture, the white stuff is all in front of the red stuff, which is behind. But the, uh, you need to have that color information. You can't tell that from the black and white image. So that's where, uh, so this is a bunch of logos here, Euclid, uh, the European Space Agency, us, and then I'm going to add where I work. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about the, um, the, uh, the uh, uh, unions, which is a, actually another collaboration. So all, everything in astronomy is all these collaborations that sort of work together more or less in harmony. And this one is called unions, which is one of these clever acronyms. Uh, I pronounce it onions to bug the person who came out with this acronym. But ultraviolet, near infrared, optical northern survey. So it's a survey of the northern sky uh, that was taken with ground-based telescopes. So PanSTARRS, which is on Maui. Uh, Subaru telescope, which is on uh, the big island of Hawaii, uh, run by the Japanese. That's not up the car. Subaru means the constellation of the Pleiades, uh, which is uh, the car and the telescope are both named after the, the constellation. And then my favorite, because I work with it, is the CFHT, Canada France Hawaii telescope. And so all the data gets comes from uh, these telescopes and comes here to the CDC to get merged and the size and then <laughs> sent off to Euclid, the, the Euclid consortium to make a colorized image of everything. I'm going to take you down a short rabbit hole that I ended up on Wikipedia when I was talking about learning about <laughs> how the human eye works and how it relates to how telescopes work. And so human eyes, we have actually four different kinds of cells in our eyes. Uh, uh, when we're at, when it's dark out, we see things in black and white. Actually, using our our rods, uh, which have a sensitivity quite that spreads out over most of the the spectrum. So here's blue, red, and it it sees all the colors roughly equally, and it, you can't tell colors. Uh, when you're right now, you can see the colors because you're using your cones, which come in three flavors: S, M, and L. I don't know what that stands for, um, but it might be short, medium, and long. And they are, they see different bands. What I hadn't realized though is that they overlap quite so much. So your blue cells see this part here, but your red and green cells actually overlap hideously. Uh, and I, this is a terrible design. <laughs> I can tell you from 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 having worked in 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 in, in with filters over the years, uh, this is the worst possible way you could do it. This is a much better system, <laughs> and this is what uh, the data that uh, that we're sending to Euclid and they're sending back. So the Euclid Viz camera takes excellent black and white pictures over a wide. Uh, swath of the spectrum uh, and because it, it's in space it takes super sharp images and then from the ground we have the color information uh, which is nicely separated not overlapping like the human eye uh, in U for ultraviolet G for green R for red I for infrared and Z for we ran out of letters <laughs> Uh, so yeah, Euclid will make a very nice, sharp, high-resolution map of the sky, but, but it needs the color information, which we're doing it. So in exchange for that, we're getting the Euclid data back to Canada. Euclid has the main science, which I talked about before, uh, but there's also, whenever you take a whole bunch of pictures of the sky, you learn something weird. Uh, you, you learn, it can be used for mul multiple different purposes. So it's also going to look at uh, asteroids, but only weird ones because it's not looking where the normal asteroids live around the, the around the sun. Where the, it's going to be looking only at ones that kind of instead of going around the sun like this, they kind of go in a weird orbit. But you also look at stellar streams in our own galaxies, uh, nearby galaxies. You can look at the the center, but then Euclid will be able to detect the outer fringes of them that we can't see from the ground, and uh, look at the star formation ridge of. 
oh, it's just the launch list I'm running out of time here. But <laughs> and then the last thing is whenever you do take a whole pile of data, you're gonna end up so with something you're gonna find something you didn't expect to find. And that's actually I think gonna be the coolest part. James Webb's gonna do this, Euclid's gonna do this, uh, there's gonna find something we didn't expect. So that's the, one of my favorite quotes from Isaac Asimov over there on the right. Um, that you know the most exciting things you can hear in science is that's funny. <laughs> so uh, Euclid has not exploded. Euclid will survey a third of the sky. Uh, Euclid will study dark matter and a bunch of other stuff. And we get to participate in Euclid by sharing our color data exchange for their high resolution data. And if you want more information, there's the URL. Uh, the Euclid comms team would love it if you went to visit them because I was at a talk uh, two weeks ago and they were very proud of their new shiny new website. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for that. Um, are there any questions? I have a question. So I'm just wondering about the, the different bands that you have. The I band and the Z band are both in what looks like blackness. Right. So um, how are they different? So there are two different kinds of a red, and I can't draw them different colors because your eyes can't see at those wavelengths. So they both look, that's how you would see them, but the camera can see them as two different things where Z is further, uh, more, like more infrared than the night band. Yeah. Is that just scale? Very rough, weird. very roughly. Uh, not, I worked with the images I could find using Google image search. Uh, <laughs> so they're, they're, they're kind of near infrared. Exactly. So it's the kind of the, the same infrared that your remote works on. How long will a Euclid function for? Six years. Uh, so uh, the way it works is Euclid is now on cruising out to L2. It'll be there uh, in about a month. There is a uh, two, three month um, science, sorry, performance verification phase where it just basically takes pitch, random pictures of the sky while well, we're trying to make them not random. That's a whole other story. Um, I mean, because there's some interesting science you could do with that data as well. Uh, and then there's what's called the ERO, which is the early release observations will again take a bunch of stuff that's not as core science, but are mostly publicity shots. And then the survey starts in earnest in, uh, if all goes according to plan in November. In December, we get the first little teaser taster of the first data set we'll forget, which is only a few tens of terabytes. And then a year later, we get the first real data release one, and then uh, six data, five data releases after that. After that is TBD. Uh, it'll run out of some of its propellants and whatnot, so it might not be functioning properly. It's not like the Hubble that can sort of keep on going indefinitely, uh, but it's got a six year planned survey. Thank you. So you're going to study dark matter, but you can't directly sense dark matter. Are you inferring its nature by looking at what you can see in these various bands? So Euclid mostly doesn't study what dark matter is. It mostly studies how it's mostly interested in the galaxies and which of course are and how they how, how they came together. It will study some of the properties of dark matter and that sort of the bulk properties and also I didn't go into that because I only had 20 minutes, but there's also the dark energy, which also feeds into this uh, process by, by making the universe expand faster. But it doesn't go into like, okay, it has to be this kind of a particle or this kind of a whatever. That's not really its main thing. It's like, how does the dark matter affect the universe as opposed to what the dark matter is itself? This is just to make sure you get on the tape. Thank you. Thank you. A couple of questions for you. How long did it take to develop Euclid and what was the cost to do that and how does that compare to uh, a James Webb or Hubble? Well, 
way faster and cheaper. <laughs> so it took about uh, 12 years, which seems like a long time. Like it was actually uh, two different message m missions that were fairly similar. And then the Euclid, sorry, the European Space Agency said, no, you guys work together and just built one telescope. And so they did that. So depending on how you count it, but from Euclid, as Euclid, as opposed to these other two missions, to launch was 10 years. The schedule slipped by two, as opposed to James, and its total cost is just under 1 billion euros, as opposed to James Webb, which is like 12 billion euros. It's, I mean, my first job was working on James Webb. That was in 2001. Uh, okay, and that was in, I was not there at the beginning. I, I was working on, stuff that had been started five years before that. So uh, way faster, way cheaper. Um, anyhow, yeah. Sorry, one more question. In developing the telescope and also in the data that's brought back, is there any, are there any AI capabilities built into this? So artificial intelligence. So the answer is where it's mostly being used. I mean, who knows what's going to happen? But, uh, you know, AI is a rapidly develop developing field. So who knows what's going to happen? Machine learning will be coming in. Uh, I was talking about how to determine the distance of, of things. So turning the, the 1D, sorry, the 2D map into a 3D map. Going from colors to distance is kind of an art form. Uh, well, I mean, well, no, what am I saying? It's a science. But there's, there's other, multiple different ways of doing it. Uh, and one of the ways now that is quite promising is using machine learning. So there's about two or three different uh, tech, um, uh, software, pieces of software that are work, looking at that. I suspect machine learning will also come in in like classifying the galaxies for the other sort of non-core science, so-called legacy science. So it'll be heavily used. Uh, there's also machine learning will go into, so. Uh, finding not just the finding all the weird stuff is also going to be part of machine learning things. So you can classify everything, and then okay, well that's weird. But if you have to look at the the, the fifteen thousand square degrees, the third of the sky, it gets tedious if you're actually looking at each object. So there's various machine learning techniques to go through and find all the weird stuff and show it just so the weird outliers to people. And then uh, there's also ways of finding strong gravitational lenses using machine learning. So partially. Machine learning is very good at pattern recognition, which is when you have a large data set with lots of different colored blob, shaped blobs in it, it's probably going to be used for that, I would guess. Anything else? Anyone else? How full is the parking lot of L2? <laughs> How full is the parking lot of L2? Not very full, and it's a huge parking lot. <laughs> so the parking lot is considerably larger than low Earth orbit, because uh, actually, here, I have a slide. Here we go. So here is what L2 looks like. Here's the sun. Here's us. The Earth should be actually smaller in this picture. And then, but the orbit of the moon around it is about basically the scale. And then here's L2. And you don't actually park directly at L2. You actually orbit around this part in space and uh, kind of a uh, complicated orbit. The chances of it running into James Webb is minuscule. So imagine driving your truck across. Canada, not necessarily on the roads, but everywhere. And there's only one other truck in the whole, <laughs> in all of Canada. What are the chances to randomly run into it? And supposing you can actually talk to both that truck and the other, and your own truck, which is the situation where we know where all the stuff is, uh, the chances of being school. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. And if you missed anything that you really wanted to hear, we'll be back at nine. Hi, everyone.
This is What's Up in the Sky for July 8th, 2023. Check out our website for our daytime weekday hours. Be sure to check out our gift shop in person or online. And we're grateful for your memberships and donations, which help keep our educational programs running. Note that our weekday hours are now extended until late September. Sunset is at 9.15 p.m. tonight, now a couple of minutes earlier than the latest sunset on the solstice, with the sun setting at 306 degrees in the northwest of the sky. Sunrise is at 5.21 a.m., a couple of minutes later than the earliest sunrise, with the sun rising at 54 degrees in the northeast. That means that the sun is striking the north face of a house for some time in both the early morning and evening. At this time of the year, the sun illuminates the north side of a building from 5.21 a.m. to 8.45 a.m. and then in the evening from 5.54 p.m. to 9.15 p.m., a total of almost seven hours of the 15 hours and 54 minutes of daylight today. Astronomical twilight doesn't end until 12.22 a.m. and begins again at 2.14 a.m., meaning that there is less than two hours of full darkness. However, the moon will be up and will be well illuminated and will be interfering with the darkness tonight. The moon is past full and is about two-thirds illuminated. It rises at 12.24 a.m. and sets at 11.58 a.m. And will, and will add to the sky glow. Last quarter moon is on July 9th, new moon is on July 17th, and first quarter moon is on July 24th. This two-week period is the best time to look at the fainter objects in the summer sky, such as the Milky Way. As it gets dark around 11 p.m., you'll start to notice the bright star Antares in the constellation Scorpius due south. The center of the Milky Way galaxy is to the left of this star in the constellation Sagittarius. The Milky Way stretches up high overhead through the, the sky east of the overhead point. You'll also see the bright stars Vega overhead, Deneb and Cygnus, and Altair and Aquila all in or near the Milky Way region. In Japan on July 7th, they celebrate Tanabata, which is similar to Valentine's Day and involves a legend of two lovers separated by a river. The story originated in China. The stars Vega and Altair represent the two lovers and are separated by the river represented by the Milky Way. They are only, they are only allowed to come together on the 7th of July. So far, I have not seen this happen on the 7th of July, but I'll keep checking. In the evening sky, Venus is the planet to watch at the moment. How late in the month can you see it? It might not be visible in a couple of weeks as it overtakes the Earth and moves closer to the Sun in the sky. Watch as it becomes more and more like a crescent shape in a small telescope. You will also notice the image ripple and shift, especially at higher magnifications. You're seeing the effects of the heat being released from the Earth which is what causes point-like sources uh, like stars to shift and break up and create prismatic effects, something we call twinkling. Planets have a wider angular size and it takes a great deal of air turbulence to make a planet appear to twinkle. After a particularly hot day, does Venus appear to twinkle, especially if it's low to the horizon? What about Mars, which is fainter into the upper left of Venus? With its much smaller angular size owing to its small physical size and greater distance, it is much more point-like and is more likely to exhibit twinkling effects. In the morning sky, Jupiter is in the east and Saturn is in the south-southeast at 3.30 a.m. as twilight sets in. As for solar activity in Aurora, the sun is reaching solar maximum and sun, uh, sunspots have been visible every day this year. A large group of spots was visible over the past week. Stay tuned to the spaceweather.com website to check out the latest photos of sunspots and solar activity. We sometimes get a heads up on sunspots from Mars of all places. The Perseverance rover is equipped with a solar filter for making images of the sun and also measuring the sun's brightness. The brightness estimate gives scientists an idea of whether the sun is dimming due to dust storms on Mars. However, it also, it, it's also spots the actual sunspots at times. And uh, recently it spotted a very large sunspot group just before it was visible on Earth. Mars is looking at the sun from a different angle in the solar system. Try building a solar pinhole projection system with tin foil and a large box as we've described in previous months and see if you can detect this new spot. Remember, never look directly at the sun even through a pinhole. The idea 
is to put your back to the sun and project the image onto a white surface. Thanks for listening and keep looking up.